And in this module, we are going to learn how to write unit tests in C Sharp. Unit tests are about more than just testing your code. Yes, that's one reason to write unit tests, to test your code and see if it behaves correctly. But I can tell you that unit tests can also teach you about software design and help you write better software. You can also use unit tests to experiment and explore a language and an environment. I hope to show you all these unit testing benefits before the end of this module. So let's get started right away. I want to show you how to write some simple unit tests in C Sharp. But first, what is unit testing? Testing is easy enough to understand. Testing is trying to prove or verify that our code is behaving correctly. This means if we write code to compute an average grade, I want to make sure the result is the average of all grades. But I also want to test edge conditions. For example, how does my software behave if there are zero grades? Will it give me a result? Will it throw an error? And this is what testing is really all about. Not just testing what we call the happy day scenario, where the user behaves the way we expect, but also testing to explore and see how the software behaves when things go wrong, when the user forgets to enter a grade or enters an illegal value. So that's testing. And then what is a unit? Generally, a unit is the source code that we want to test. And we want to test small units of code. So in the C-sharp language, we might test the code inside of an individual method that calculates an average, and that method will be the unit, even if the method is part of a larger abstraction like a class. And finally, it's not immediately obvious, but unit testing is automated, meaning any time we write a test, we can run that test with no effort in the future using a tool known as a test runner. A test runner finds all the unit tests that you have written, executes each test, and gives you a report to tell you if the test passed or if anything failed. And think about it, this is what we've been doing manually in this course. We make changes to the gradebook application, and then we run the program to test the results by looking at the output. Unit testing is really just formalizing and codifying and automating that process to make testing easy and fast. I'll be able to make small changes and instantly see if I made a change that creates a bug or fixes a bug. And pretty much every language environment these days comes with a unit test library and a test runner that will help you write and execute unit tests. And C Sharp is no different. In fact, there's a number of unit test libraries available for C Sharp and .NET in general. In this module, we will use a test library known as XUnit. XUnit is not a part of .NET Core itself. It's a separate library that works with .NET and .NET Core. And before we can begin working with XUnit and unit tests, we first need to create a new unit test project where we will write our unit test. So let's look at those steps next. When we set up the directory structure for our gradebook application, I created a source folder, placed the gradebook project inside of the source folder, and I also created a test folder. The idea always being that we would reach this point where we're ready to create a unit testing project. Because in .NET and with C Sharp, the general convention is to write your unit tests in a separate project separate from your production code and in a project that is dedicated to unit testing. So I want to create that project now inside of the test folder. Just like we did earlier in the course, let's go out to the command line. I'm going to move into that test directory. And perhaps you remember at the beginning of the course, we used the .NET new command. And .NET new has a number of templates that we can use to construct a new project. We used .NET new console earlier in the course to create the console application that is the gradebook application. But now what I want is a unit testing project. And you can see there's unit test project, there's n unit test project, there's x unit test project. The framework that I want to use is x unit. I would say that's a fairly popular choice inside of the .NET Core ecosystem. But you can evaluate some of these other testing frameworks if you're interested to see how they compare and if you like them better because really it all comes down to what API do you like the best? Which of these do you feel makes the most sense to you or to your team? So I want to do .NET new X unit. And before I do that, let me make a directory called gradebook.tests. So just like we have a folder inside of source for the gradebook application, this is going to be a folder inside of the test folder for the tests project. Our project name will take the name of this folder, so gradebook.tests. And that's a convention you'll see in many .NET shops where any project related to unit testing will have .tests in the name. But it's inside of here where I want to do .NET new xUnit. This will create my project in this folder. It takes less than a second. 
And now let's come back out to our editor, Visual Studio Code, and there I can see gradebook.tests. I can see a new CS project file, so we have a new C-sharp project here, and I even have a .cs file with the source code to my first unit test. It's already been generated for me. Now I do want to point out that unlike our application, which is relying solely on the libraries from .NET Core, our testing project needs some additional libraries because XUnit is not a part of .NET Core. And when we installed .NET Core, we did not receive the XUnit library. XUnit is one of the NuGet packages that is available for .NET Core. You might remember I talked about NuGet earlier in the course. NuGet is a package manager for .NET and for .NET Core. There's over 100,000 packages on NuGet.org, so you can come to NuGet.org to search for packages. And these packages, some of them are authored by Microsoft, some of them by third parties, many of them are open source, but they all provide features that you can have access to just by going out and downloading a NuGet package. So this is where you will find XUnit. In fact, if I do a search for unit testing here at NuGet.org, you'll see there's many options here, including different packages for NUnit, different frameworks and libraries and bits of code that will help you with unit testing. But the specific package that I'm looking for would be XUnit. And I just want to drill into the XUnit entry here to show you that on the second tab, this will actually give you the .NET command that you could execute from the command line if you wanted to add a reference to a NuGet package to a specific project that you have. So when I use .NET new XUnit from the command line, the .NET CLI already added a reference to XUnit into my project, so I do not have to take this step. But I did want to show you how you can come to NuGet.org. You can search here for packages, and if you come to the .NET CLI commands, you can have the exact command that you need to execute to bring that package into your project and start using it. So back in Visual Studio Code, when you do add a package reference to your project, the fact that you've referenced a package will be stored inside of your csproj file. So here inside of the csproj file, it's an XML file, but you can see I have three package reference elements. And one of those is XUnit. So that brings in the XUnit library and the API that I can use to write unit tests. And the second XUnit package reference is one that will help Visual Studio execute my tests. So now that we have a new project and we have the XUnit library or the XUnit NuGet package available as a reference, Let's take a look at the unit test itself. When I created my testing project with .NET new XUnit, the project template created a unit test onecs file just to show me the basic structure of what a unit test looks like with XUnit. Because every testing framework has a slightly different vocabulary and can work a little bit differently. But here's how things work with XUnit. First of all, I'm going to have a using statement to bring in the XUnit namespace. This is one of the namespaces provided by the XUnit NuGet package, and it's inside of this namespace where I will find the types and the APIs that I need to use to interact with XUnit, the testing framework. This is how I can tell the testing framework that something failed, for example, my test failed. Now my test code will need to be executable statements of c -sharp code. And as we've seen earlier, one way to organize executable statements is to place those statements inside of a method that can be invoked. And a method has to be a member of a type. In this case, this method test1 is the member of a class named unit test1. And in between here is the word fact inside of square brackets. So this fact is what we call an attribute in C sharp. The more you program with C sharp, the more you'll see attributes used in different ways. But here's how XUnit uses an attribute. So first of all, think of an attribute as a little piece of data that is attached to the symbol that follows it. So fact is a little piece of data that is attached to this method test1. And the way XUnit uses this attribute is that XUnit, when it loads up your test project to find the tests inside and execute them and tell you what passed and what failed, it goes looking for methods that have this fact attribute attached. Because I might have, let's say, three methods inside of this class, but only two of them really represent unit tests. I would decorate those test methods with this fact attribute. So we talk about attributes like they're decorations that we hang on something like a method. There's a third method inside of this class that perhaps it's not a test method. It just contains some code that I want to call from the other two test methods to make those methods simpler, but I will not place a fact attribute on that method, and therefore our XUnit will ignore that method. It's only going to invoke the other two as test methods that have to produce a pass or a fail result. 
And all the test discovery and test execution happens when I run the test runner. So where is the test runner? Well, I will tell you if you're using a tool like Visual Studio, Visual Studio and some other tools will have a test runner built in automatically. So just go looking for a test command in the menu and you'll be able to execute a test runner directly from the tool. Visual Studio Code has an extension that I can install, just like we installed the C Sharp extension at the beginning of the course, but the extension is the .NET Core Test Explorer. That extension will allow me to execute my unit tests directly from Visual Studio Code. But I'm going to show you that everyone has at least one test runner installed because the .NET CLI includes a test runner. So I am in the folder gradebook.tests. This is the folder where my csproj file exists. And if I execute the command .NET test, this is a lot like saying .NET run, except now, instead of running the project that is in the current folder, .NET test will look at the project and say, oh, you must want me to go out and find the unit tests inside of this project, execute those tests, and tell you which ones passed and which ones fail. And that's what's going to happen when I press enter. The testing framework is going to find that method with the fact attribute attached to it. It's going to execute that test. It considers that test as a passing test. Nothing has failed, nothing was skipped. So my test run was successful. Why was that test a passing test? Because unless I invoke an API to explicitly tell the framework a failure has occurred, the testing framework assumes everything has worked well and everything has passed. So let's jump back into the editor and I'll show you how to tell the framework about a pass or a fail. So ultimately the API that you are going to use is an API provided by a class named assert. So this is in the X unit namespace. And if I use the dot operator in the IntelliSense window, I can see a number of different static methods available in that class that I can invoke to check different conditions or to make assertions. For example, I might want to make an assertion that some object is the same as another object. I might want to make an assertion that some string matches some regular expression that I provide. Or I might want to make an assertion that something is not null or something is null. So all of these methods, I can pass in parameters. And if the method finds out that something I say is not null is actually null, it will register a failure with a test runner and I will find out that this test failed. Let's look at a simple one. Let's look at assert.equal. So with equal, I pass in two values and the equal assertion will make sure those two values match. And we usually think of these two values as the expected value and the actual value. So the expected value is, what do I expect the result to be? What is the correct answer? And the actual value is, what did my code actually compute? So let's try this out. I'm going to try this out in a simplistic fashion. We're not actually going to test anything in the gradebook project just yet. Instead, let's just declare some variables and do some addition right here inside of test one. So let's say I have a variable called x and I set that equal to 5 and I have a variable called y and I set that equal to 2 and then I say the actual value that I have computed is x times y. As we all know, that answer should be 10, but let's just say that we are expecting a result of 7. So down here with assert.equal, I will pass in the expected result, what did I expect to see, and I will pass in the actual result or what did my code actually do. Now I'll save that file. Let's come back out to the test runner, do a .NET test. After a second, I will have lots of red text scroll by, which indicates a failure. And yes, I can see there was an assert.equal failure. So I expected the value seven. My actual value that came out was a 10. This happened on line 18 in unit test onecs So now I have all the information to go back into my code and try to fix this problem, potentially even run the debugger to try to figure out what's going wrong. Of course, in this case, it's very obvious because all of our code is right here inside of the test method. But typically, this little bit where you compute the actual value is calling into something that is inside of a gradebook or inside of an invoice object or inside of some sort of service that computes the amount of tax on a sale. But let me just change this code to x plus y, save the file. We'll come back and run .NET test again. And after a second, we should have a successful test run again, which is good. So this is the essence of a unit test. If you do some further reading and training on unit tests, you'll typically find most people want to break up a unit test into three sections. First, there is the arrange section. This is where you put together all your test data and you arrange the objects and the values that you're going to use. Then there's the section of the unit test that we call the act section. 
This is where you actually invoke a method to perform a computation or perform a calculation. You actually do something that produces a result, the actual result. And then you have the third section, which is the assert section, where you assert something about the value that was computed inside of ACT. So triple A, arrange, act, and assert. And now let's take what we've learned about unit testing and try to apply it to the book class in the gradebook project. Ultimately, what we want to do is make sure that book computes the proper statistics. My ultimate goal is to write unit tests that will verify the logic inside of the book class that lives inside of the gradebook project. And because of this, I want to rename this class. I believe names are very important in software development. And remember, what we're trying to do is build the proper abstractions. A proper abstraction requires a good name, and a name like unit test one doesn't tell me anything about what might be inside of this class. If my intention is to write tests related to the book here inside of this class, then I would rather call this book tests. And that's a convention that you'll find in many projects. If there's an invoice class and an employee class, then you'll probably find in the test project invoice tests and employee tests. And another good convention to follow is that your file name should match the class name. So if the class name is book tests, I also want to rename this file to be book tests.cs. So this is a good first step. And then if I'm testing the book, I don't want to arrange just arbitrary integers in here. This is just something we were experimenting with. I want to create an actual instance of my book class. And you might remember a book requires a name. I'm just going to pass in an empty string. So two double quotes. And is that legal? Well, that's a good question to ask when you're writing a unit test. Perhaps you need to go back to a business owner and say, is it legal to have a book with an empty name? If not, I need to write a test that makes sure the book throws an error when I initialize it with an empty name. Otherwise, I might consider writing a test to make sure the book doesn't throw an error when I give it an empty name like this. And now because this line of code influences what happens throughout the rest of the method, let's just for now delete these other lines of code. I will leave the comments in place, but what we want to focus on first is how we can gain access to the book class, because right now I have an error. The typer namespace book could not be found. Are you missing a using directive? Now, if you use the tip that I showed you earlier in this course, then you might place your cursor on the book identifier and press control period to get the drop down. Now, previously in the course, we were able to fix a problem like this just by saying, yes, add a using statement. But here in the list of possible items, I don't have an option to add a using statement. Instead, I have options to do things like create a new class in a new file. That's not what I want to do. I want to use the book that I already have defined, but it's in the gradebook project. And here's what's happening. When I'm writing code inside of a project, like when I'm writing the code inside of the main method here inside of the program class, I have access to other classes that are in the same project. That's no problem. But if I try to access a class that is in a different project, then I need to tell the C-sharp compiler, I am using this other project. And when you come across something like book, please look in these other projects to find that particular type. Currently, we don't have any information associated with gradebook.tests to tell the C-sharp compiler to look somewhere else. We do have a NuGet package reference. NuGet essentially allows me to do the same thing. I can say, go out and reference this NuGet package X unit. And then when you come across an identifier like fact, make sure you're looking inside of the libraries associated with this NuGet package to find this particular type. And then of course, we just have to have the using statement in place for the C-sharp compiler to be able to find that type. But before we can even do that, we need to have a reference to this other library. How do we do that? Well, if you're using Visual Studio, it's very easy to right click on your test project and say that you want to add a reference to another project and then just point Visual Studio towards your gradebook project. I want to show you how to take the same steps, but using the .NET CLI. So out here at the command line, I am going to type the command .NET add. With .NET add, I can do one of two things. I can add a reference to a package. So I can add a reference to a NuGet package. So if I did a command like .NET, add package and the name of the package like X unit. Well, I already showed you this command earlier in this module when we were looking at NuGet.org. This would be a way that I could add a reference to X unit from a project if the template hadn't already provided that for me. In this case, the class that I want to use, the book class, is not in a NuGet package. It is in another project. So what I want to do is add a project to project reference to this project. So I want to type .NET add reference 
and let's just press enter to see the help text that comes up. And I can see that I just need to specify a path to the project file. So let's try this again. Notice I am in gradebook.tests, by the way, when I'm doing this. So I want to .NET add a reference to the project that is in this current folder. And the project that I want to reference, it's going to be up to, that will place us into the top level folder. Then I want to go into the source folder, into the gradebook folder, and inside of there should be gradebook.csproj. That is the project that I want to reference. And when I press enter to execute that command, I can see the reference was added to the project. What does that do behind the scenes inside of my csproj file? In addition to my NuGet package references, I also have a project reference. And I can see the relative path here into gradebook.csproj. You can have as many project references as you need for a given application or a given library. It's easy to find complex systems out there that have at least a dozen projects inside, and they reference each other in this fashion. But now that I had that project reference, if I come back out to my CS file, the error message has changed. So now the C-sharp compiler is looking at that other project, and it is finding the book class. And that's why the error has changed. The error has now changed to say that book is inaccessible due to its protection level. We saw a similar error message earlier in this course when I tried to invoke a method that was not marked as public. We have a very similar problem here. If I look inside of book.cs, I can see there is no access modifier associated with my class. I do have an access modifier of public on all of the methods that I want to expose. But it turns out that on a class definition, if you do not explicitly specify an access modifier, you will be given essentially an access modifier of internal. Internal means that this class can only be used inside of the same project. So I could only use this book class inside of the gradebook project. What I want to do is expose this class so it's available to my unit testing project. So I'm going to, again, use the keyword public, just like I have on my methods. And that's telling the C-sharp compiler, anyone who references this project has the ability to consume and use this particular type. So again, this all goes back to creating the proper abstractions and using encapsulation. If book was an implementation detail that I only needed inside of this project, then I could leave it as an internal class so other developers don't see it and worry about it and think they have to use it. But in this case, I do want to expose the book class. It's a primary abstraction that I'm building for the gradebook. And at the very least, I want to be able to test this class. So I am going to make it a public class. And now if I come into booktest.cs, I have legal code that will compile. Now, many times there's one more step that you have to take. So once you find out what project or what library or NuGet package that a type exists in, you have to add a reference to that package or to that project. And then you have to add a using statement to make sure you bring the namespace into scope for that class. In this case, we are in a namespace that is underneath the gradebook namespace where the book exists. So in this case, I do not need a using statement. So I already have access to everything that is in the gradebook namespace without having that using statement. And so now for an arrange, what I would typically do is something like add some data into the book. So let's add a grade of 89.1. Let's also add a grade of 90.5. And let's also add a grade of, let's do a 77.3. So this is the arrange section of my test. I'm arranging the data to act on. And down here is where I would say, dear book, I want to show statistics. Ideally, this would compute a result that I could write and assert on. But currently, show statistics does not return a result. Let's talk about that in the next clip. Ideally, when I invoke show statistics on my book, I would get back some sort of result that I could write asserts on. So my code would look something like declare a variable named result, allow that to capture whatever show statistics returns, and then I would start writing asserts on that result. So I could say things like assert.equal, and let's say that we're going to look at result.average. That's going to be an actual number because that's what our software computed. And I'm going to compare that to the value 85.6, which is very close to what the average should be given these three grades. So ideally, this is the type of code that I want to write. In fact, it's the type of code that I need to write if I expect to be able to properly unit test my class. And this is one of the great, great features of unit tests. It's a fantastic side effect of writing unit tests. And it's one of the reasons I encourage people to keep writing unit tests, even when they become discouraged. And what I'm talking about is that sometimes your unit tests force you to have a better software design. And at the end of the day, what we want is working code. So yes, code that produces the right result, 
but we also want a good design and a good architecture and the type of code base that we can come back to in five months and still work on it, or the type of code base where I can bring in other developers and they can understand what I'm doing and they can make changes to that code base to add new features. So sometimes I use unit tests to prove that a piece of code works, but sometimes while writing those tests, I uncover something about my design. And here's what I'm uncovering about the method show statistics. It's doing too many things. If you try to describe what a class does or what a single method does when it executes, and you have to use a conjunction word like and, there's a chance that that class or that method is doing too many things and you need to break that method up or break that class up. So what does show statistics do? Well, it computes the average grade and the highest and lowest grades and it shows those grades on the console. So this method has a lot of different responsibilities. Not only is it doing the computation, it is also displaying the results of that computation. And one thing you're going to learn about software, particularly if you write unit tests, is that you want to build smaller pieces and you want to separate the deciding from the doing. So I want to separate executing the calculations from displaying the results of those calculations. Those are two vastly different responsibilities. And by separating those things, I can build smaller pieces, and that's always the goal. One of the problem areas I see with new developers is that they tend to write large methods and they tend to write large classes, and these large abstractions are difficult to maintain. You want to strive to write smaller methods and smaller classes. So here's what I want to separate. I want to separate the calculations from displaying the results of those calculations. So instead of show statistics, what I want is a method compute statistics or get statistics. Let's use get statistics. So all I want this method to do is compute the statistics and I want those statistics returned in an object that will carry those calculation results. So I want to be able to say, yes, this is result.average. And I want to be able to say that if we were to look at, let's say the highest grade, I would expect that to be the 90.5. So result.high. And let's also do an assert dot equal on 77.3 that this is result dot low. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing code that doesn't exist yet, but it gives me a good idea for the type of class that I want. So first of all, I'm going to have to rename this method. So let me copy this, come back to book.cs, and instead of show statistics, we're going to write a method or have a method named get statistics. And now instead of returning void, which is really saying instead of not returning anything, I need this method to return an object and an object that has the following state associated with it, an average, a low, and a high. How do I construct an object? I construct an object from a class definition. So let's write a class definition, a class that will have the fields average, high, and low. And this class doesn't have any other responsibilities other than being able to transport and carry the results of statistical calculations. So I want to create a new file. Let's call it statistics.cs. And inside of here, I do want a namespace of gradebook. So I want to make sure my class is inside of that namespace. And I will want a public class called statistics. So the same as the file name. And now let's use the public keyword to say, I want a field of type double whose name is average. So coming back into booktests.cs, that will allow this line of code to compile. I also need a high and a low. So this is very similar to the field definitions we did before, or the field definition that we did before inside of book.cs when we declared a field of type list of double. Now I'm just declaring multiple fields, and this field will hold the high value, and the next field I declare will hold the low value. And of course, the difference is that these fields are public. I'm not going to hide them. Sometimes you want to make your state available to the outside world. Other times you want to hide your state because it's an implementation detail, like the list of grades that we have here. But now that I've made these changes, I need to change get statistics so it actually constructs a new instance of this class and returns this class as the result of invoking get statistics. So let me copy this class name, come back to my get statistics method. And the way that I tell the C-sharp compiler that this method returns an object of type statistics is to use that class identifier here, statistics. So this is a public method named get statistics and it's return type. That is the type of object it's going to return is statistics. I could also have it return a double. So that would return a single floating point number, or I could have it return an integer, or I could have it return a list of floating point numbers. But no, what I wanted to return is an object of type statistics. 
In order to return an object of that type, I will need to construct or create an object of that type. So let's say that result, instead of being equal to 0, 0.0, let's say it's a new instance of statistics. So now I have a variable named result that holds a value that is a reference to an object of type statistics. And I could say that I want to initialize every field inside of here, but technically this is already done for me by the .NET runtime. So it's going to make sure that all the fields inside of a particular class, when it's instantiated as an object, they will be set to what we call all bits off. So all bits in the memory space are zero. And that means for a floating point number, the value would be zero. But I do want to have high and low be these special values so we can perform the calculations correctly. So let me say result.high equals the minimum value and result.low equals the maximum value. And now I just need to continue to fix up my code to adjust for this refactoring. So down here inside of the loop, we no longer have a variable named low grade. Instead, I want to go to result.low and compare it to the existing result.low. So really, this is just a search and replace operation for the most part. This is result.high, and it's going to compare that to result.high. And finally, I could also say result.average. That's where we're going to sum our grades as we go along. In fact, I would actually rename this variable. This is how particular I am about names. This is not just a number that comes out of anywhere. This is, in fact, a grade that is in our list of grades. So I would want to use grade here throughout the rest of the method. So let me replace number with grade everywhere I see it. And then finally, I can say that result.average is result.average divided by grades.count. And then finally, what I would do is remove these lines of code that are displaying the result to the console, because I don't want that to be the responsibility of get statistics. So I'm going to control X and cut those lines of code out from here. If I want to display the statistics, I will do that somewhere else once this method returns those statistics. So how do I return these statistics that I've computed? Well, I use the return keyword in C sharp. So I can say, let's return the result that we've computed, and that will be an object with the fields average, low, and high populated with hopefully the correct results. But we'll find out in just a second. I could go into program.cs at this point and modify this to make sure that things work, because remember, we renamed show statistics to get statistics. So I'm going to make that change. And we're now returning statistics. So let's just declare a variable named stats. That's going to be equal to the value that is returned by get statistics. I'm going to paste in the code that I cut out of book.cs because I do still want to display these statistics to the console. But now I also need to fix up this code. This is what we call refactoring. When your unit tests force you to redesign your code, you refactor that code to improve the design. So that's stats.low, this is stats.high, and finally, I would have stats.average. Let's save all of our files. Remember, the goal is to execute this unit test, which places these three grades into a book, tries to get the statistics, and then we write assertions to make sure that we're computing the correct results. Let's go back out to the command line, and what I want to execute while I'm inside of the gradebook.test folder is .NET test. Once this executes, I will see that there is a bit of a problem. And the problem is I expected the value 85.6, but the actual average that was computed by my code is 85.633333. Now, if you've been programming for any length of time, you might already recognize what the problem is. And the problem is that when you're using floating point numbers, it's very easy to get into these conditions where a little bit of a loss of precision can force you to fail when you're trying to compare two numbers exactly. So when I write in my unit test that I expect the actual result to equal 85.6, that means 85.6 exactly. And something like 85.633, which I could easily round down to an 85.6, that's not an exact match. So anytime you're trying to do an exact match with floating point variables or floating point numbers, that's a potential problem. Fortunately, most unit testing frameworks will give you a way to solve this problem in an easy fashion. And in this case, with XUnit, when I look at assert.equal, there is a third parameter that I can pass to this method, and that third parameter is the precision, so the number of decimal places that will be used in the comparison. So I can say I only want to check to one decimal place. 
Let's do that for not just the average, but also the high and the low. Save all our files, come back out, run a .NET test, and now all my tests are passing. In this module, we spent some time refactoring our book class, and I didn't give you any exercises to try on your own. That will change in the next module, because before we continue to add features to the gradebook, I want to cover two important topics that have been lingering around since the beginning of this course. So in the next module, we are going to use what we've learned about unit testing to explore and understand reference types and value types in C-sharp.